So welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. This is kind of an interesting opportunity for me because I'm, I'm moving a little bit closer to the edge. I'm getting a little edgier about what's going on in our field. So you're going to hear you're going to hear a little bit about the past, the past 3.8 billion years of being uh, a hominoid, and then we're going to zoom right up to artificial intelligence. I don't know how much you think about, or worry about, or consider, or integrate all of what's happening into your teaching, but there is a lot happening, and it's not a joke, and it's serious, and I want us to touch a bit about it. And then, luckily, we have 60 minutes to talk some more about it. But I'm not going to talk about LMSs. LMS, I think, is what ruined the whole field. Then along came MOOCs, and you know we got even worse. So now let's talk about moving forward. Um, let's see, what do I do? So, a little bit about me. So, I've written quite a few books, six on this. I actually started writing in 1986 on this field when everyone told me it was crazy, what a bad idea. People have telephones. We don't need to use computers to talk to each other. Um, I began to study in the 1980s what, is, what could online education be? And everyone again told me that was such a bad idea. Um, I've ran some really major projects. I've built uh, an online collaborative learning platform. I ran a $50 million research network. I also ran one of the largest um, field trials of online education in the world. We've learned a lot of lessons. Um, I'm now trying to write books that put together some of the lessons. But, so, I've written my latest book, is that one, Learning Theory and Online Technology. I think it's kind of interesting because there's a couple of chapters in there that deal with connectivism, that deal with uh, the attack of the teaching machine, the teacherless classroom. I really think you need to look at what's going on, at where the big money is going into, and it's not going into classrooms, it's not going into more teachers, it's going into fewer teachers. And we've got some real issues, but teachers hold the key. So that's why I'm giving this pep talk. So I also taught the very first totally online credentialed classroom course in the world at the University of Toronto in 1986. So that's another whole lot of stories. Okay, so that's me, done with me. My purpose. Well, I'm going to actually start a little bit with human civilization. I teach social media, and I start at 3.8 billion years ago, million years ago. So I want to celebrate us. I want to celebrate teaching and learning. I want to, I want to look at the challenges. I want to look at the pedagogy of what you guys are doing, what's going on. And we got to start looking at AI and alternatives to AI, because AI is getting more investment by Google, by Facebook, by Amazon, by Microsoft, and by Apple, what we call GAMFA, or the New York Times calls the Frightful Five. There's more money going into AI every year than, if you're American, than your, what is it, Ministry of Education is putting into education. They are putting more money into machine learning than into human learning. And these are really serious issues because they are a huge threat, not just to teachers, but to the whole race. So, okay, so essentially, hominids started 3.8 million years ago, and then by about 200,000 years BCE, Homo sapiens came. Now, I don't know what you think your definition is of men and women, but the cognitive anthropology, the official definition of what distinguishes humans from other great apes 
is that we are intentional collaborators. We're not competitors. Apes and humans are social animals, but apes are competitors. Humans are collaborators. And that's very important. It's important in how we teach. It's important how we live. It's important how we strive, how we, how we thrive, and how we civilize. We are collaborators. Don't lose, you know, don't lose sight of what we are genetically. And that, that we survived because we collaborate, because our kids were all dying, because as we, well, anyway, it's a long story, but as we started walking, we could no longer birth children when they were ready to, um, Survive. So we had to birth them at a very young age, and then we had to take care of them. And then, as a result, we began to learn speech, later writing, printing press. We began to develop education, technology, and knowledge system. It came from, as we went from down here to up here, our changes. We also started eating better. Our brains got bigger. It was hard to give birth and keep these babies alive. And that had a lot to do with what we became. OK, so just briefly, what is human civilization? Well, our collaborative intelligence revolution and speech were sort of like they came together and they flipped us into a new world. They flipped us into a world where we began to live in communities and states. Agrarian revolution, we started making them surplus, so we started selling grain and cattle. And if I'm going to sell Kurt a, a bag of grain and I want a goat, Kurt has to put the name Kurt on the goat. And my bag of grain has Linda so that we can make sure that you know we get. That's how writing came from, from business. And then we moved up into, biz, into printing. And that was boom. Once we began to print cheaply, people got to read. People became knowledgeable. The year that the printing press came out in Europe, one million people learned to read. And that was after the bubonic plague. As soon as we got reading, we create, had a science revolution, enlightenment, American revolution, French revolution, all men are equal, industrial revolution. And boom, the AI internet, we're at a crossroads. Because we're at a crossroads where technology is now about to take over. Either we're going to have a knowledge revolution or we're going to have an automation revolution. So here we are. Here we are, cute little people. And we're just bouncing along from whatever, 3.8 million years ago. And that's us right now. We're just hang, you know, hanging out, la, la, la. That's a long way to walk. I have to keep that. <laughs> I'm going to stand here. Um, and then we start developing this tech. We start developing computers. And Marvin Minsky in the 1950s said, you know what? People are lame. We don't like biology. We don't like meat. People are not efficient. We need technology to be more efficient, and he's the father of AI. So now AI starts growing up, but meanwhile, here we are, cute little human up at the top, still giggling, oh, these machines aren't going to be anything, they're not a threat, look at their cute little ants and monkeys and blah, blah, blah. So that's our view. Some of us may still have that view. If you haven't read the New York Times or The Guardian as of this morning or anything, you probably still think the world is like that. However, we are very close to a tripwire. And this is not a joke. This is, this is science. The tripwire is when human intelligence becomes overcome by artificial intelligence. And we're really coming close to that. Computer performance is about to outpace human. And that may happen in 2025, 2029, 2045, depending on what. But it's happening. It's happening. Your grandkids are going to be part of it. Your students are part of it. 
So we are at some really serious places. And when, because we have this um, intelligence that keeps multiplying, keeps multiplying, it's zooming up. Humans are like this, we grow slowly with artificial intelligence. It's doubling every six months, every three months. And all of a sudden, one day, it's going to go past us, and we cease to become important. We become the ants of the planet. Because who runs the planet is intelligence. It's not power, or else it would be gorillas or elephants. It's not speed, or it would be, I don't know. It's intelligence. And as soon as there's a species that's smarter than us, we cease to have a role. So we've got to think exponential growth. And there's a whole bunch of guys in Google and in, and in uh, Facebook. They're really into creating computers that are smarter than people. That's their whole MO. So now what are we going to do? OK, some, this is the last time I'll walk over. But what you see here is around the turn of the 20th century, we began to have AI. And if you look at 2000 or 2020, that's about where we are right now. So we're at a, a mouse brain, but we're actually at a human brain. A computer is now equal to a human brain. We call that normal um, artificial intelligence. We're, we have computers that are equal to our brains. In a few more years, by 2040, according to that, if you go up, the computer intelligence will be smarter than all of humanity. And then a few seconds after that, it's too smart for us to know what it is. So this thing is we're talking about in the next 20, 25 years. So we need to get real and start thinking this is the real world. It is not Blade Runner. It's not any of that. This is your world, my world, our students' world. So now let's get into the so what. Do you know what the definition of artificial intelligence is? Anyone? <laughs> Come on. What's AI? Huh? I don't think anyone does, but I think we think it means something that can think like a person. Well, it actually thinks like a person for a minute, then it decides that's too little. Um, the AI, the, the, the definition I like the most, John, is AI is defined as the computer acts alone doesn't need any humans. And I guess it was yesterday in um, the, the headlines in The Guardian was that knowledge-producing um, knowledge computers are now. Now, I propose something different. I propose something called AHI, Augmented Human Intelligence, in which we're not going to stop AI. But I think we need to harness it. I think we need to control it. And I have some ideas on it. You may disagree with those ideas. We'll talk about those ideas. But I think it's essential that we address that. So the computer now acts through human intentions, not on its own. How do we get to that point? So humans are at this crossroad between AI and AHI. And I think that. Teachers are at that crossroads. And I'm going to argue AI is just like MOOCs and, you know, computer-aided instruction and PLEs and adaptive learning system. All of that is stuff without teachers. No live teachers, just computers. So AI is based on individualization, memorization, and you're completely at the mercy of the algorithm. In AHI, the humans decide. And what's really powerful there is collaborative learning, where humans work together, think, use the AI 
but it is part of the intentional decision making of the humans. It is not deciding human activity. Human activity is deciding what's going on. So that is my, that's where I'm throwing my, that's the star that I'm hitching my wagon to. <laughs> I think we can do it. What we have to do, teachers, is start teaching kids to think and not to follow rules, and not to memorize, and not to spit out answers, but to think, to problem solve. We face a really unprecedented challenge. I mean, either we're going to be replaced, and we already are being replaced. Look at what's going on in the field. We're being replaced. There's a lot of teacherless courseware that's going on out there, and they make money off of it. MOOC is making, you know, just hand over fist money because there's no teachers, there's no disobedience, the kids have to do whatever the software says, there's no thinking, there's no discussion, there's nothing except spitting back the answer. So either you're going to be replaced by AI, and or you're going to have to change your pedagogy. I think we have to change our pedagogy. We really have to. First of all, it's time. And secondly, we have no choice. If we want a job and we want to retain a human planet, we better start teaching in a way that makes humans more humans and less like machines. We ought to stop these lectures, stop the didactics, and start getting people learning how to collaborate, learning how to discuss, learning how to solve problems using AHI. I think you're key. I actually think of all the professions, you are the key. You are teaching the world how to think. So let's get serious about it. Let's talk about how to do our role better. Who's laughing? <laughs> so here's, a, here's the crossroads. So you've got AI. Here's what AI, all this stuff, courseware, MOOCs, personalized learning environments, adaptive learning environments, all that blah, blah, blah. No teachers. No living teachers. Individualized learning. The poor student is at the mercy of the computer, of the algorithm, Edu of the correct answer, and the student has to obey. If you put down a wrong answer on the quiz, who are you going to argue with? The algorithm? Education is automated. The software is packaged. It's delivered 24-7. The grades are all auto-graded by the AI. And the AI decides your future. Are you going to be a university student, a college student, a dishwasher? Are you going to be sitting in some back alley, I don't know, collecting plastic bottles for recycling? Computer acts alone, and it leads to an automation revolution. And that's where we're headed versus augmented intelligence. And I really see collaborative learning as being in charge of AI and using it for real world problem solving, teachers and lear learners use AI to develop pedagogies of, art of, of augmented human intelligence to create a knowledge revolution. I think that's where we're at. I, I don't know what you think, but that's. Um, so again, we have the versus or, the, the title, my title was Artificial Intel Intention versus or and collaborative learning. So I think, I think we should really make an effort to grab this AI and use it instead of being used by it. So a uh, hundred years ago, the French were asked how did they see education in a hundred years? So this is there, and this is basically pretty close to courseware, and it's probably basically pretty close to MOOCs and all of that. You have some guy just pushing in a bunch of books, 
And then that's all going into people's heads. Uh, that was the, oh, here it is, down here. Um, the option, the alternative is collaborative learning, collaborative education. So that's a common kind of little um, diagram. But collaborative is learning is a pedagogy and a theory. It's not a huddle. Collaborativism is going to use AI tools. We're not going to avoid them. We're not going to stop using them. But we're going to use them in a teamwork environment to develop AHI, to do problem solving in real world scenarios, to work with and develop knowledge industries, to develop, well, what we're doing now. We're creating a knowledge community right here. So how are we building knowledge? How can we use advanced tools? And collaborativist learning is also based on group discussion, what we're going to be doing in the next hour. That is how knowledge is built. People debating, discussing, bringing in ideas. Um, so I say that collaborativism is more than a huddle. We have to do more than you know peace and love. We have to understand the pedagogy. So I've developed a theory and a pedagogy of collaborativism. I'm going to briefly talk about it. Where I don't have a oh. OK, I do have a clock. Uh, so you see, in collaborativism, the teacher has an important role. You probably have heard of constructivism. You may have all joined the, collaborat uh, the constructivist you know, band line. But one of the problems of constructivist theory is it doesn't really tell you what the role of the teacher is. You know, learning by doing. What do I do as a teacher? Active learning. What do I do as a teacher? That's one of the, that's one of the, that's one of the places we got hung up and left behind. And so what I did when I was articulating the collaborativist learning is I tried to really think, OK, what's the role of the teacher? Is there a role of the teacher, or are we really done with teachers? But the teacher is really essential. The teacher provides the content expertise. Like you guys are all coming from the knowledge community. You're coming to the conference. You're learning more content expertise. The other thing that you provide that's essential, that isn't in a MOOC or an OS in a PLE or courseware is a process expertise. You help your student, your students get into discussion and they begin to learn to talk the talk and they learn to walk the talk. They learn the language of your field, they learn to apply it to problem solving, and then they learn to debate and discuss and build and contribute to the discipline. So in my theory, there's three major processes. The process is I, G, I, O, I, C. I've got 18-month-old twins. They love I, E, I, O, E, I, E, I, O. Um, so here's the three processes. And you will know these. These are not strange. Students come together. And they have ideas. They don't come with empty heads. They've got ideas about what this is about. Even if it's about mathematics, they've got some ideas. So they come and they've got tons of ideas. And so the first thing they do is idea generate or brainstorm. I think it's this. No, I think it's this. No, I think. If you read the transcript, it's all I think, I think, I think. And then as they begin to read more about the field, they start to organize ideas. They say, oh, gee, I really like your idea, but I'm not so sure about your idea. And then we begin to debate. More reading, more discussion, more involvement. And we get to a point of intellectual convergence. I don't know what your definition is of learning. 
if you have a definition of learning. When you go to teach, what is your definition of learning? But the definition of learning in a group environment is intellectual convergence. You come to a convergence. You move from divergence to convergence. That doesn't mean you all agree, but you understand each other's language and perspective. And there's a fourth part, which we could call knowledge building. So if you're a medical professor or a law professor, you're going to probably go through the practice. I'm a communication professor. So while we do some role plays, we don't actually get into the field. So these first three are kind of the conceptual frameworks. But if you are in more of a professional field where you actually apply it, then you go down to the social application. So that's like a fourth process. So that's the theory. And here we have the theory and the practice. In this case, the teacher puts the students into groups. She gives or he gives them a knowledge problem. This is the kind of problem that you're going to be dealing with in your field. This is a real world problem. And then she helps them work in the groups to resolve those problems. She takes their experience, their inputs, but also provides resources, readings, and books. So they start off with idea generating, and then as they get more sophisticated, they get rid of some of those ideas that are weak, and they move on to idea organizing. There, if you're looking on a transcript, if it's online, you're saying, oh, I agree with Jerry, but I'm not so sure what Tom is saying. Why do you even say that, Tom? I didn't see that in the readings, and someone will, so we begin to organize ideas. And then again, after some days, some weeks, depending, you come to an intellectual convergence. So that's the theory and pedagogy of collaborativism. And, and that I do online. So online education, you see, there's two pedagogies. You have you have the cognitivist one or connectivist or whatever, the MOOC one that is basically the teacherless one, the one on the left. No live teacher, artificial intelligence controls the lectures. Video lectures are the way that knowledge is tra uh, content is transmitted. Online quizzes versus collaborative learning on this side which is live teachers are engaged, there's peers, you debate with peers, you develop critical thinking skills, knowledge building, and of every, anything that's important about collaborativism, it's discourse. Learning is about discourse. I can't remember who it was, a famous person defined science. Science is talk. That's what he said. Knowledge is talk. Talk between the students. Talk with the instructors. Talk, engagement. It is not sucking in content and spitting it out. It's talking about it, de um, developing ideas, debating it, all kinds. It, discourse is the most important thing in learning. So, what kind of, so just some ideas for teachers who are here. You can, if you're doing online, you can do lots of stuff. Sometimes I have plenary group discussions, which everyone in the class is, discusses. Then we have small groups. We have team projects, dyads. Sometimes we have debates, form, oh, it should be formal or informal. Role plays, simulations. And then there's one that I just recently wrote a handbook on it, so if anyone wants it, email me, which is called SOS, Online Seminars. And it's really clever because in the online seminar, 
The students teach it, not me. <laughs> so they come up with every seminar is really interesting. They do a lot of work. They come up with a lot of topics. They learn about it. And then they have to facilitate one another. So student online seminars, SOS. So we have this. And then what I'm doing this semester we're starting to use AI tools, such as augmented reality, mobile learning, VR, some virtual reality, gamification. Each of my four groups are going to tackle one of those problems. So I'm ex exploring how we can begin to use collaborative learning with um, um, artificial intelligence tools. OK, so just briefly, where are we? Well, we've still got time. SOS pedagogy. The member, so a, a, SOS pedagogy. Students have two roles. Either, for one week, they're a member of the moderating team. And that's when they really learn how to teach. And they sweat about how they're going to get the students doing the things they need. How are they going to come up with interesting discussion questions? How are they going? So they do that for one week. And then for three weeks, the students are discussing in those, meta, in those um, uh, seminars. So one week. So for example, if you have 16, this is just a, a what the hell number, 16 students. Four students are moderators one week and the other 12 are discussants, then the next four, and then the next four, and the next. So you have four seminars. So it's just a mathematical thing. You could do with three. You, know, you could just play with your numbers. And what do they do? So it's pretty cool. I've been doing this since 1990. I've done it with second year students. I've been teaching online seminars for so many years, and I have never been bored. Every topic is so interesting. If I was doing it, I'd be dead, <laughs> deadly bored. But these guys really get into it. They want to do something interesting. So they get 10, uh, if you're a moderator, 10% for the quality of your presentation. What's your topic? What's the design of the topic? Is it going to be role play, debate? What are your discussion questions? And that's the killer app, right? Because if they've got lousy discussion questions, there's not going to be much discussion. Since everyone's getting graded on this, they need to get really good DQs. So that's the first day. The whole week, they get graded on facilitating. Are they? moving the seminar from IG to IO to IC. 10% on that. And of course, if they don't have good discussion questions, there's not much action at facilitation. And then at the end, they do a retrospective analysis. I'll, look, I'll show you some of the retrospective analysis. So that's what the moderators do. And I've got some moderators, as we speak, who are really sweating over what they're going to do. Um, then there are three weeks in, as discussants. So they have to log on daily. They post eight messages. They reply to other messages. Again, if there are lousy discussion questions, the discussants are getting ripped off. So there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of acknowledgment on the part of all the students that the way you run a seminar or the way you run a course really matters. You really have to think. And you have to think of where you want them to get to. Then you work your way back to the first question. You don't just come up with three cute questions, because then they're all hanging in the air and they go nowhere. No, you've got to head somewhere. You've got to reach intellectual convergence. So they really work on that. And it's hard. And also, as you know, Teaching students is like herding mice. So they might say, OK, on Wednesday, we want to do DQ1. And of course, no one shows up. So they have to say, come on, students. It's all online. Um, and then your um, 
your posts have to contribute to IGIOIC. So when I grade them, I grade both quantitative and qualitative. I make sure that they post enough messages, but the grading is weighted for qualitative. Are they, are they contributing? Are they building knowledge? Is there IGIOIC? There's a, a, a quantitative and, collab and uh, qualitative. You need the qualitative because everyone needs to participate. If they're not participating, if they're not replying, if they're all just saying, well, I think, well, I think, that's not collaboration. Collaboration is when you say, well, I read the readings, but I didn't get that point at all, Michelle. I thought, on the contrary, that's when you get collaboration. Now, Michelle has to think about what she said and think, do I really, did I make a good point? Should I defend it or should I chuck it out? So you're constantly refining your ideas and you're building knowledge. It's very important to always keep thinking, this is not just about sending and receiving messages. This is about learning and collaborating and building knowledge. So we make learning visible. So come now we're at part three, towards the end of the... Once you do the transcripts, all of the seminars online, now you can study everything. The total number of messages, the date, the gender, the role. So these are taken from different student reports. So you see, we can just see how many messages in total were written per day on that particular seminar. And then we can see how many messages were written by message type. So there was a few that are procedural, and then there's a few that are ice-breaking. And now we see quite a lot in this particular class, and trust me, every class has its own culture. In this class, there's a lot of work gone into idea generating, and then into idea organizing, not so much the, into intellectual convergence. Just a few messages on socializing, moderators wrote a lot, and the instructor didn't write that many. So they, every seminar gets this analysis. So we, again, this is another course, another perspective on uh, what was going on in terms of volume in general, number and volume. Then you look at how many per day, and what are we looking at here? Oh, volume. So it's interesting that the number of messages and the volume are pretty close. Sometimes you get few messages, but they're very long. And you also get, as you move from the beginning to the end, the messages tend to get longer. We're seeing the moderator at the bottom, the instructor is sort of bopping along at the bottom. <laughs> then you have the discussant, and then you see the overall. So you kind of see the structure of that discussion that week. We look at, oh, I don't know what that is. OK, so this is for me, this is for me what's really important. This is change over time. This is learning. The first one is they get started, and the first one is idea generating, brainstorming. So you see that's the first peak. They're getting started. In this case, they're not writing so much, they're just getting into it. Then they start addressing DQ2, which is idea organizing. There's a lot of activity in DQ2. It must have been a good question. Students feel excited, they're interested, they're active. And in fact, in this particular case, intellectual convergence has also captured quite a bit of activity. And again, every course is different. They have different cultures, different you know, interests. But what I see there is something you don't see in class. You don't see it in exams. You don't see it in quizzes. What I see is learning over time. That's learning. In this class, I can see sometimes, well, I'll show you some other ones where there's hardly anything. Other times where there's 
way over the moon. I can see differences. But I see learning. And we have never been able to see learning happen. We have never been able to see if all of a sudden there's a big dip. We can look at the transcript. What happened? Did someone disappear? Was it a lousy question? Did, you know, we can, as professors, we can begin to look at and see what's going on in our courses. This is a different class. They made a different, but again, the top three are change over time. And in that one, you see the most activity was in idea organizing, a little bit in idea. And then down along the bottom, the social and the procedural. But you can see it. And if there's something weird, I took out some of the weird ones because I didn't know how much time. But you can go in and figure out why was it weird. Uh, you can see roles, the discussants. They are much more active than the moderators. And then you see the old instructor bopping up towards the end. But you can see things. You can see who's doing what, when, how. OK, this is some, now here we got some interest. So this one was kind of unusual. This was gender differences every day. And you had. Most of the time, the women wrote more than the men. But all of a sudden, on the weekend, boom, the guys rushed in to make sure they got their done. In the next one, what I see there is I can see what every student did, how much IG they did, how much I owe, and how much I see. Like, for example, Miriam didn't go to IC. Um, princess didn't do I.O. or I.C. Like, you can begin to see what each student was doing. You can see so many things. You can cut it across so many ways. And look at your course and see what's going on. Oh, let's see. Female, male. Oh, OK, so this was another one that was slightly interesting to me. It was. On my system, you can either add a new message or you can reply. And I said replies are important. But what I see is, at the beginning, the women were doing all the posts and the guys were only replying. Towards the end, the guys started doing a lot of replies. But the new ideas were coming from the women. So you know, you can just see. Like, it, it's sort of like looking at the body. You can really see the anatomy of learning. All right. So there we go. That is the collaborativist learning theory and pedagogy. If AI wins, we're going to be an automated planet. If AHI wins, we will have a knowledge revolution and humans will smarten up. Whoops, what happened? So, <laughs> so you can say to your students, you're the result of 3.8 year, billion years of evolution. Act like it. <laughs> it's time we smartened up and stopped being, you know, lame. And also, uh, Leonardo da, Vel, uh, da Vinci talked about we need to study the science of art and the art of science. We need to get smarter. We need to use our heads better. We need to be thinkers and not just copiers. Um, so thank you. This is the book. It just came out. Uh, a lot of this stuff is in uh, two of the chapters. It took me a while to think about how to deal with AI and stuff. That's my. Um, Email, and if you want the handbook of SOS, I, I'm happy to send it to you. Oopsie. And then, teachers, do what robots can't. They can't teach students to learn and to think. We can. Let's do it. And let's create a knowledge society. So thank you, and it's right on time. <laughs>